Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And on the other end is Andy Morgan. I think, Andy, you were actually on episode 35 and 36. And we're like on over 250 episodes now. So I kind of feel bad that it's taken this long to bring you back on. Um, And that's by no means uh, saying anything to you and the work you've been doing. Um, It's more me and, I don't know, not thinking about things uh, and bringing you on. Because I I really appreciate Andy. I appreciate the work he does. He is a great guy um, and great for the industry as a whole. And if people aren't aware of who he is, I will give a short introduction. So he is a coach um, and he's the owner of RipBody.com, which I think... Hopefully, quite a lot of people are aware of. Um, A huge website with tons of amazing resources over on there. He also co-authored, and if people haven't heard of those two things, they will have heard of the Muscle and Strength Pyramids. I almost have no doubts about that. So he helped Eric Helms and Andrea Valdez on the Muscle and Strength Pyramids, which of course are amazing. And uh, also also an author of his own texts um, and recently updated his diet adjustments manual which was called the last shred which maybe some people own uh, which would be pretty cool and we're going to be talking a bit about that but i did want to just ask yeah what's what's been going on the last few years since I, it was actually 2017 you were on so uh yeah how, how have the last few years been treating you andy not as well as you mate you're a huge <laughs> now uh, the teacher becomes the student uh, it's, it's it's great to see man it's great to see i appreciate um, that how things have grown uh you know you've you've taken on pascal since we spoke um then now you've got uh, three other coaches that are working that uh, are part of your team um it's brilliant i'm loving seeing it it's an absolute pleasure and it's now at the point where it's inspiring me um i am still a one-man band i don't have any plans on taking other people right now I, I, i have no plans but Um, it's great to see what you're doing and I think you're definitely making the difference that you set out to do when you started things and when we were talking four years ago like you are you're there now and I'm excited to see what you're doing next well I'm glad uh Andy is like I I I still look up to Andy in in many ways and, and in a big way and Andy if people don't know helped me uh when I was like yeah literally just getting into things and it was after the episode we spoke and Andy was like do you want to like we can do some chats and things and I was right at the start of my career the podcast was right at the start of it like episode 35 and uh yeah Andy helped me in in many ways and so yeah I'm really glad actually thinking about it like I'd hate to ever think that I could be a disappointment to someone who, especially like yourself, you invested so much time into Revive Stronger. And so I'm glad actually it's come to where it is now. So that that's really cool. I oh, mean, back then, if I could, if I was a gambling man, if I could buy stock in, in people, like I'd absolutely buy stock in you. I said that of Greg Knuckles as well. Yeah, that would have been smart. Seven years ago <laughs> when I met him, like he's just mega as well. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And you know, it's a... Uh, What's been new with me? Um, we got the the just on my bookshelf down there. We got the Chinese physical editions of the uh, the Muscle and Strength Pyramids. Um, we're about to get out the uh, uh, complex Chinese, so simplified mainland Chinese is different from um, what's used in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Slightly different writing system, and uh, we're going to get those out as well. So excited about that. In Japan, we're about to get out the uh, nutrition pyramid. We're just speaking to a printer uh, this week, actually. Um, so we're gonna. We decided to do really nice hard copy physical editions, um, no digital for that. Um, with it's part of what the market wants here in Japan. Yeah. And more recently, for my English language business, so ripbody.com, I've just got out the third edition of my um, book on how I coach. So it's called the Diet Adjustments Manual. Um, the first edition of it was called the Diet Adjustments Manual. When I rewrote the second edition in 2017, I, I got fancy and called it The Last Shred. Um, I really like just descriptive titles. I'm kind of a no-nonsense guy. Um, but I, I guess I just had a, I don't know, it was all right, I guess, the title. But now, because I've now covered bulking phases, transition phases between them, um, I wanted to change it into something, you know, just descriptive. So I changed it back to the diet adjustments manual. So we're in the third edition and 
uh, I'm really happy to have finished it because now I'm like, okay, this is good. This is up to my 2021 standards. Did you uh, see the, the, did you get to see the 2017 edition, the last shred, either the first yeah. or the second edition? Did uh, you compare I, the two? Uh, what, this book to the last shred? Yeah. I actually haven't. I, I did, I read the last shred, but this one, yeah. like you said, way more in depth and you had loads of client case studies as well which i don't remember if they were in the last shred or certainly not as many which is so really they, cool they to were in there. yeah there were five thank you man there were five in the last one but it was a short much shorter section and this time i just went poof, straight in um i think 54 pages of like client uh stuff just the their spreadsheet the the details me going over video on, on exactly pointing out different things in the data why I made the decision to adjust the macros at this point that I did, why I didn't in other cases, full cut phases, transitions, bulks, um, just so that people feel less alone. The second edition it was, and first edition it was, I was showing client results over 12 weeks, which is quite limiting. Yeah. Now I've got them some half a year. One of them's even uh, close to a year and a half. They're crazy. Span. Like some of the, so, the guys in there. Some of them did really like, like and the adherence of, of like most of them, because I needed clients that had solid adherence so that I could show the principles at play yeah. best, but over a long time. So that's why their adherence is super high. That's also why I put the one client in there who really struggled with adherence. And that is just an email exchange over, well, a week. Um, and I'm kind of talking through how he can get himself in the zone to adhere. Yeah. Um, Cause I didn't want people to think that, yeah, their, their adherence should be a hundred percent all the time. That's just completely unrealistic. If I back up a second, sorry, in my excitement here, it's, it's a book essentially about how I make the decisions I do when I'm doing my coaching. Um, but I've, Put training aside. If people are interested in that, they can go to the Muscle and Strength and Nutrition uh, Training Pyramid, and they can uh, look just at the nutrition decisions. So, where the Muscle and Strength Pyramid Nutrition book left off, which is about nutrition setup, and yes, you will have seen a section in there on diet adjustments, which I spoke with Eric about when we were writing the second edition. I said I really wanted a section in there on diet adjustments, and he he let me run that basically. Um, for that second edition of the book, but that is just a small section, like it's a 260 page book or something. Well, this is like a 290 page book just on, okay, your diet set up, how are we gonna assess things, see whether you need to make a change and, and do it. How are you gonna pick a goal, cut bolt recomp, and then what's that gonna look like in phases over time? Why is this shit important? Excuse my French and how does it all look and put together? So to kind of like, uh, you know, pull back the curtain on how easy it can be when all of this theory is in practice so that people don't get it in their heads that they need to be micromanaging all the time. Yeah. That's really where the, the client examples kind of come in to reassure people, I think. Because not everyone can afford coaching and I don't yeah. think everyone should. And not everybody wants it either. They want to figure it out themselves, a lot of people. Yeah. I think most people do, but they get to a point where they're like, wow, you know what? I just want to hire the guy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I guess if you're, I imagine I can just see this, one of your clients reading this and being like, yeah, I mean, this is exactly what I like Andy does with me and like all the kind of, they're seeing through the matrix type of thing where it's like, I've been through this and now like here's the written script of why. And this is something I know, uh, like it was like seeing through the matrix with me with uh, RP and their kind of uh, scientific principles of strength training, where they just like put names and things and processes in place for training that really made sense. And when I look at this, this for nutrition and the nutritional adjustments is very much the same where it's like, I know as a coach reading this, I was like, yeah, this is like, you've just really, like if I was to tell someone what I do, I'd be like, Oh, Andy's book is like a really good example of what I consider like advanced you, nutritional man. coaching to be where it's just like, this is every step that as a coach you should be taking. So I was looking at this, like, actually as a like a new online coach or something, like obviously there's a lot of co online coaches now, especially with the day and age we're in where one-on-one -on -one is like has been very challenging over the last year. Like if people are a bit unsure about de decision-making, like they kind of know 
like energy balance. They know how to set up a diet, but then like getting into the weeds. And this is where your experience really comes in, where you've worked with tons of people. It's like, you've been through this so many times. And it's like you said, it's 2021 now. And you've been doing this for so many years. You've just got to the point where it's like, I can lay out everything, like almost like it, like you had a lot of fl flow charts actually in the book, which is just, and they weren't like really simple. It was like, like you covered everything. I was like reading through, I was like, there's nothing really I'd add here, which I thought was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, man. And, and yeah, if, if you are new to coaching, uh, get, get it. Yeah. Just you, you'd be an idiot not to get it. Um, it's, it's really a no brainer if you're a professional to invest in your education. Like I think the, the only question for the recreational trainee is, are they at a point where they're already counting their macros and they're frustrated with their progress? If they are, is it worth potentially worth that cost? That is, you know, maybe, maybe not, probably. Um, but for someone who's a professional, like they absolutely should get it. And let's say that you're a professional and you're like, ah, oh, I can't afford it. It's like, all right, send me an email. I'll give it you for free. Link me to you like you, you buy, prove that you're a trainer. That's fine. All I ask, you pay it forward. Yeah. When someone comes along later on and they need help, you help them. That's, that's a deal right now with the people listening. I love that. Yeah, it's, I, I can, but this book is just, it, it, it's just how your brain works, which is great, where you systemize mm. things, you break things down and where something's very complex, you can kind of see every stage and work it through. Whenever I talk to you, that's where I'm like, my brain just doesn't work that way. Um, so I think like if there was anyone to write such a book, like I can see why this was written by you. Uh, and something I did want to touch on was, and I, I really liked it. I, and actually brought up, this is literally a direct quote from the book. It says, the constant learning is what I love about this job, but it's a double-edged sword because I'm continually looking back at my old work and feeling the need to update it, which I guess is why you ended up coming out with this. Um, and obviously, yeah, you said like you've doubled the length and you've already answered a question where I was asking kind of what's different to the muscle and strength pyramids. Cause I mean, having read it, I was like, yeah, this is a completely different book. It's like, you kind of pulled out a huge book within a book almost where if people yeah, were yeah. left wanting more, they've kind of got that. Um, and something I it like within the book, there's loads of graphs, which are amazing because you kind of, it allows people to visualize and see the difference, which I think are really cool and unique to you. Let's, let's put a caveat on that. They're, they're amazingly like kind of school, school childishly Simple. quirky. Like, yeah. Cause I, I'm just me, little old me on my iPad <laughs> and pencil. I got dangerous during lockdown. Right. I figured out that like my, my iPad could work with the, the Apple pencil. And I was in a, a Skype with uh, Mike to share actually. And he was like, Oh, so the concept he's trying to explain, Andy, does it look like this? And he put something up on the screen in a zoom call. And I was like, yeah, wow, how did you just draw that, right? Because I'd never thought to draw digitally before. And he was like, oh, I'll just use this Microsoft Surface thing. And I was like, well, I ain't going to do that. But then I was like, ah, oh, Apple got an eye. Yeah, so I just started sketching and then sketching and re-sketching. And yeah. and yeah, you can kind of see the type of thing for free that we're talking about here. If you just go to ripbody.com slash start, that will take you to my free nutrition setup guide, which you can think of as a muscle and strength nutrition pyramid light um so and then you'll see the kind of drawings that i'm talking about there stick figures that kind of stuff but you visually like i personally i really appreciate a visual it helps log things in my mind and if someone's talking or trying to explain a concept to me as I'm trying to store that, I will be trying to think of a visual myself. So I've thought of me in mind. <laughs> I know not everybody's the same, yeah. but the feedback's been really good. But yeah, it was it's like you said, like these aren't, even the book in itself, uh, it's not like it's massively complex. It's not like packed with like references to science. Like it, it isn't that. It's a very, very practical book. And those graphs are like, Sometimes people, like you said, they just struggle to visualize like, oh, what does a recomp look like? And you just have like, this is how fat will trend. This is how muscle will trend. This is what your body weight will do. And it's just like, like it just clicks. Like I'm probably similar to you and that I have a, like I, I like visually seeing things and the graphs are just, yeah, it's just, it, it ex just makes the learning of the process much quicker. It was something I know on, even on your application form, I believe if it's still there, you have this kind of process of kind of data to wisdom. And I'd love you just mm. to, talk through the listeners through there. Cause I know you have a segment like at the start of the book, talking through that and why 
like it just kind of lays the foundation for why everything in the book is important um could you be more specific i i know the sketch that you're talking about there but could you be more specific about what it is you'd like me to talk through yeah i guess it's because this book is written from like wisdom eventually which you kind of laid mm. out is from like data to information to knowledge to insight to wisdom and it's just how yeah i guess <laughs> it's not really a question it's more mm. just how you're collecting data that's important to you which eventually is leading to like information you need as a coach have you got kind of where i'm going yep yep absolutely i do yeah so um data you have maybe have data on your fitbit you maybe have data on the the packets of pasta that you have you don't have data on the meat that you're buying in a supermarket but you can certainly find it from my fitness pal you know that macros are kind of important you've got a rough idea of how important for your goals you know that calories are slightly more important um you have data from the scale weight that you may be taking every day um, you may be taking it at the same time of day. You may be taking it just once a week. You know that this is changing. You know that your visual appearance is changing in the mirror or not really. It kind of seems to fluctuate. Why? Why is that happening? You know that your pants feel, uh, uh, trousers. Um, I've been around Americans too <laughs> yeah. long. Uh, <laughs> I've been in Japan 15 years. Loads of Americans here. So um, you know that like the way that they feel, they fit slightly looser or or tighter um from day to day but then that will change over time all right you know that you could take body measurements i'm a big fan of doing that i get them to people to do it in nine places so like the limbs at the stomach uh, three fingers above three fingers below the navel once on the hips not and the chest chest and back there right that will if you take that once a week over time more data do you then also want to um, include that step count in there from your fitbit or your iPhone, do you want to have like an app to track your sleep or is that now too much? Data, 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 data. Okay, that's great. What do you do with it? Right? Because we're sold like, oh, if you do this, you can figure out about your sleep. It's like, great. But what do you actually want here? You want to wake up feeling less tired. Or well, here's one for you, right? Sleep long enough so that you wake up less tired. And that's the answer. Are you waking up knackered or not, right? Sorry, a bit of a rant there. Sleep um, is a great example. <laughs> just because I know <laughs> I've spoken to even sleep experts and they're just like, that. these things are measuring it, but they're not giving you any practical suggestion of how to do anything. So right, anyway. Right, So it's <laughs> so like it's sleep more things will improve. So then yeah. what, what's your end goal? Okay, maybe it's to feel less tired, but for a lot of people, people listening to this, it is to look a certain way. Okay, how are you going to get there? What's the plan? What data is important? So then the wisdom at the end of this spectrum, we've got data at the one, we've got wisdom at the other, and then we've got kind of like knowledge of how to piece it together, kind of in between. So how do you take your data, interpret it, and then decide what to do at any given time point? And then are you gonna try and Look at that every day or every week, two weeks, 10 days, randomly, right? I would suggest you look at it every couple of weeks and then you look back over long strings of data so that your emotions can't get the better of you. It keeps you objective, right? Yes, you do want to have some subjective measures in there like uh, sleep, stress, hunger, uh, fatigue. Um, I get clients to rate them on a zero to five scale just so I kind of know where they're at because um, how they feel is also important as well right how you feel otherwise everyone would be shredded right because you wouldn't be hungry and knackered yeah um so yeah it's just that's where the book comes in we're thrown loads of nuggets of okay you need to sleep more you need to eat enough protein you need to kind of do this it's like okay well how does it all fit together into a plan well that's like nutrition setup and it's like, okay, well, once you're there, how do you then track things and interpret that data and then know when to adjust if necessary and how to adjust to get towards the actual goal? That's where this comes yeah. in. That's why it's so important. And I think sometimes where people get really thrown, thrown off, and I'm glad you really you covered these because 
they don't get covered. They just don't get spoken about is the transitions between like a cut to a bulk because people just hear like, yeah, you just should be gaining at this rate or whatever it is, or a bulk to a cut and you should be losing at this rate. And like people in that first few weeks, they're like losing their mind because they're like, this is, this is wrong. And then they end up potentially yo-yo dieting. They spin their wheels because they're just making too many manipulations. They get confused. So yeah, I'd love to hear your kind of some of your thoughts behind those transition periods, what people should expect. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. Well, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things here. One, um, if people, that's why I think the graphs were important here, the sketches were important because there's the rate of weight gain that you want to shoot for when you're in a bulking phase, and there's a rate of weight loss, which will be mostly fat or all fat, um, when you're usually all fat, when you're cutting, right, in a cutting phase. But what does it look like when you start to cut? Oh, no one told me about this initial weight dump. Woohoo, I'm losing three pounds a week. It's like, no, you're not, buddy. You just lost uh, gut content, muscle, and uh, sorry, muscle glycogen and um, water, right? Because you're eating less. Now, flip that. You've ended dieting. You've finished dieting, and now you're you're moving into a bulk. And boom! Oh shit! I just gained like five pounds in um, two weeks. And I'm feeling really full and jacked and veiny and wow, right? And you're like, shit! This bulk's going amazing. And unfortunately, it is not muscle, right? I mean. <laughs> It would be lovely if it was, yeah. but uh, no, it's not. It's just a regain of glycogen and water and sure, some gut content there, and it hasn't spilled into like fat storage just at this point. And so you're looking the biggest that you have in a long while. What does that look like? People forget to teach people about these things. Yeah. Because they're like, I'm, why do you think keto is so popular? Well, I tell you. Part of it is that people start a keto diet, they cut out all their carbs, they lose a bunch of weight, like seven, eight pounds in the first, like uh, maybe that's a higher end for some larger people um, in the first like week or two. And they think it's magic. And it's like, no, nah, sorry, man, it wasn't fat. You've probably got like a pound, pound and a half per week in there. But you're only going to see that after a few weeks once yeah. you've got the trend line, right? And then people feel trapped because they'd feel they can't end the keto diet because once they do, like they're like, oh, well, I had this loaf of like bread and pasta when I went to this Italian restaurant and the next day I was three pounds heavier. Man, keto is the one true God, right? Um, and, and people end up feeling trapped. But if you understand these fluctuations in, and what, what they mean and why, then you're able to see the actual progress. You can yeah. see the results through the noise. And the transition phases, why I think they are so important is that if you go from a cut to a bulk too aggressively, you will regain more fat than you otherwise needed to. And when that happens, it means that you will have to spend longer in the cutting phase afterwards. Or you will have to end your bulk earlier than you otherwise would. Not that you have to, but most people, they feel that they are uncomfortable at a certain point and they want to cut again so that they can see their abs. They just feel too fluffy. And if they do that, they can end up feeling trapped. Uh, that, sorry, they can end up spinning their wheels. They're never really achieving enough muscle gain during their bulk phases and never really getting lean enough during their cut phases because they start to feel skinny, where they can then proceed with the bulk phase after without feeling fat. And they end up bouncing back and forth, not really achieving anything. Yeah. And they've got to kind of bite the bullet one way or the other, they, but they don't. So what does that look like? Um, when it comes to a transition, why wouldn't you just increase, uh, why wouldn't you just recalculate let's say you go to ripboy.com slash macro hyphen calculator little plug there why wouldn't you just do 
a bulk calculation from there and bam, just start eating those calories straight away. Well, because your metabolism, unfortunately, has had the brakes on it for a little while. And sure, it's not like you're not at a stop here. So that's a bit of a shit analogy. But like you're coming into a corner and you're, you're at a racetrack, right? You're turning. Your speed is now slower. OK, it's going to take a little while to ramp back up. You're in a Skoda or whatever insert shit car here. Um, you can tell that I'm like an 80s child there because um, <laughs> they're good cars now, right? You're not in a race car. It's not going to immediately come back up. So if you start eating too many calories, then if you start, if you make a calculation based on what your metabolic rate would be under normal circumstances, not those diet circumstances, then you're probably going to eat too much and regain too much fat. And in the other side, after you've been bulking for a while and your metabolism is now fully ramped up and you've probably got a ton of neat in there, if you switch to uh, cut cutting calories, you are hmm, you could end up losing a little bit of muscle um, because you've now set your calories a little bit too low there. So what I prefer to do is get people to transition based on their own data. Yeah. I and love that. simple math for that is if you've been losing a pound a week, half a kilo a week for people who prefer that. I'll keep it very simple here. Then you can increase by 500 calories each day. That will bring you up to maintenance for your currently lower load slowed metabolic uh, metabolism. That is still going to be under maintenance because your metabolism will then speed up slightly, right? So a heuristic I came up with, I was just discussing with Ken and Nauta, who worked for me on the Japanese site, is add your body weight after that. This is for non-competitors. We have a different calculation for that. Um, but add your body weight in pounds to that number of calories. Oh, each okay. Day. Interesting. So if you were, um, I don't know, if you're 150 pounds, you're adding 150 calories on top of that. And that will be your first step towards maintenance. Yeah. And then you can, you know, follow the adjustments in the maintenance chapter where you, you sort of like little jumps after that. Or you could then just bam, go straight into your bulk. Yeah. And the reverse happens the same for um, bulking to dieting transition phases. And when you look at this over time, I'll shut up in a minute, don't worry. When you look at this like over a longer time, why does this matter? Well, you're trying to get to like a certain goal physique. If you keep screwing this up, it's going to take you double the time, like double the time, double the effort, even if you, if you even get there, right? So it is absolutely in your interest to just not screw this up. And, and that's like, kind of where we come in as coaches, right? It's yeah. like, yeah. I was just going to say is to continue with your analogy of the, the turn on the bend. I'm thinking of like a Fiat Panda. I don't know why that's that's the car that comes to mind when I think of uh -huh. shitty shitty old cars. Um, but I'm a '90s, so I'm a bit younger. Uh, Fiat Panda, no, it's great, great. Go on, continue. I'm gonna put <laughs> with the lights these, on. Go on. So if you keep on kind of screwing up these bends, like that's how you lose a race, right? You're not gonna win the race. You're gonna take a lot longer down that journey around the track, which is exactly what you're saying there. So uh, it, it's actually a very good analogy, and it, I, I see it time and time again where people mess up these bends and then they mess up like the bumps in the road along the way where you're talking about these small adjustments and something I really loved was people often just look at and I mean unfortunately when you see sign that sign uh, sound, sound bites is what I'm trying to say on social media and maybe it's an infographic I put out and I talk about like making adjustments on like a mass or a cut and I just talk about like scale weight and then I maybe don't give it enough context surrounding like oh you need to be adherent and all these other aspects. Something I thought was really cool that you talked about was the difference between like a gradual slowdown to like a sudden halt, which I think people would like appreciate uh, you expanding on. Oh, sure. Yeah. So if you're trying, let, let's say your weight loss, essentially it's as, similar, it's as simple as this. If your weight has suddenly stalled, but you your activity levels are the same and your food intake is the same, you know that you're just holding on to water. So you don't have to change anything. You just need to be patient and not panic. But people panic at that point, right? And that could last for, well, several weeks, unfortunately. 
if weight loss is gradually slowing over time and now you're waking in the morning you go into the bathroom you're weighing yourself you're doing that every day you're then taking an average each week and then you're looking at that trend over time i'm talking about here right if it's gradually slowing. It was a pound a week. Now it's like 0.8 per week. Now it's like about 0.7 per week. But your diet adherence has been good. What is that? Well, that's either your activity levels have gone down or perhaps there's some metabolic slowdown in there as well. You can check if your activity levels have gone down if you've got like a step tracker. My iPhone happens to do that, which I just found out about recently. Oh, really? <laughs> so, oh, well, that's kind of intrusive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've got clients over the last year to, I say recently in the last year, um, I have a, I've had clients for the first time I've asked them to report um, step counts, not all of them, okay. only when I think appropriate, just because of lockdowns and opening yeah. and closing, it's changing their activity expenditure, uh, lot, their yeah. activity levels and therefore their energy expenditure for a lot. So yeah, I should caveat this. I say a lot like, you know, there's there's one guy um, it was in France and they've had like, well, I, I guess like similar levels to what's happened in the UK, yeah. but um, he's in a bulking phase. So we need to be careful about the adjustments we make there because gaining phases, the amount of mass that you gain each week in, in the way that I think about these things um, is going to be lower than the rate at which you lose weight. Yeah. Um, takes longer to build a house and burn one down kind of thing um so i need to make we're making smaller adjustments overall here but he it's about 300 calorie difference each day i've been seeing with him whether it's lockdown versus not something like that and that is an estimation here but that's the difference between him gaining weight steadily like at around two ish pounds a month about a kilo a month which is roughly what i want for him at his body size right now and training experience level versus zip nothing nothing happening yeah right it's it's really funny you bring that up because i like step counts particularly in like dieting phases and gaining phases often would be like 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 i, I imagine you're of a similar mentality as i am mandy where it's like i want every bit of data that a client's tracking for me to have actual purpose. Like I don't want to be looking at stuff that they're tracking and just being like, I'm not using that. I, you said that. I thought you were about to say, I want more data, the better. I was no. like, no, 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 no yeah. absolutely not. Like if, when they start giving me more, I'm often, I'm more gracious about it now than I knew how to be before. I'm like, I appreciate <laughs> that. But sometimes more is just not, not better here. Yeah, it just adds like, like I want to simplify the process for them and also for me not to look at stuff that's just not important. But I had the same where I had like some PTs who now weren't PTing and on their feet all day, but they're in a mass. And then I didn't have, didn't kind of see the kind of step count change and they suddenly started gaining much quicker than they should. And I was like, damn, we should have been monitoring that a little bit. So I can see why right. you made that change to like monitor it a little bit to get that understanding of, like you said, it could it could lead to no like weight gain, or it could suddenly, if they reduce theirs, it could double, and that again is unnecessary fat that they're now gaining, which yeah sucks. <laughs> uh, and I, I think when once all these lockdowns end, I don't think I'll get clients probably to track it anymore. Yeah, I might ask them roughly what is it, but assuming their activity levels don't change, like that they, they just have a a regular daily pattern i don't think i'll worry about it if i were working with a competitor let's say i can see it being useful there especially towards the tail end of a diet when they're yeah. you know they're really getting uh, lethargic but you know, i'm sure you've talked about that with other people so it's not not even going to yeah but yeah no no for sure and actually it's i don't know if you have i don't know if it's a rant you have inside you to talk about <laughs> like the overwhelm like i i guess data can be sexy yeah. Steve, I have many rants inside <laughs> me, my friend. Inside Please, you for this? just poke. Poke the tiger as many times as you wish. Yeah, Go, it's just, just it, it's something give I'm, me a word. <laughs> I'm passionate about like data, but it's become almost like potentially in the industry, like a bit of a marketing tool for some coaches to gather like just tons of data. Like I've been asked from clients for certain, like they're like, oh, why are we not tracking this, this, or whatever it might be? And it might be like, uh, heart rate variability or something and uh, or various metrics like uh, glucose monitoring or something 
And I'm just like, I, I just wouldn't have value. I wouldn't see the value in that as like, I can coach you without those numbers. It, it wouldn't provide me extra benefit that I can't get from other data. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if you have, have had that, experienced that. You give me a brilliant idea. <laughs> we are going to do colostomy bag coaching. Obviously we'd have to like, um, <laughs> package that in a better way but this is like the new way of ensuring like um come on think of some bullshit here like that the, we know exactly like what's going through and the quality of it and we'll get them Pictures to grade <laughs> grade it yeah, yeah yeah they'll be able to see it you will see this in real time all you need to do is lift up your shirt and look right mm, disgusting have i had that uh not so much fortunately because I'm very fortunate in that, like if you come to my, most people find me through Google. Most people, when they find me through Google, they do not find the coaching page. They find me through another article. So the path for someone to become a coaching client, and I'm very happy about this, frankly, is that they, they read a lot of stuff. They try it out themselves. Most of them try it out themselves or they're like, oh, I've already tried all this and this was great and you're clearly the guy. And then they come and hire me. Yeah. So they're already on board with everything I do. They've, they know how I think. I want clients to read the book. I, I don't want them to feel the burden of having to. They certainly don't need to have to. But I think if they do read it, it'll be really reassuring. Because they're like, ah, well, this just confirms everything I thought and he's totally got this. Because, you know, sometimes you give shorter answers where because you don't want to mess with people's heads too much and say well you know uh, currently we could have this or this might be happening or this is also possible but uh you know i'm really not sure here right you just give a, <laughs> a, a, a <laughs> i just feel like right? i've done this <laughs> in like some updates like just playing a guessing game here guys <laughs> yeah it's like i'm fairly certain that x however if something looks off in two weeks rest assured definitely make a change right yeah um what was the question? Uh, it was like, it was oh, essentially data, just, too yeah. much stuff. Do people yeah. ask me for, no, no, not yeah. really. No, because they were already familiar with how I think and um, what I've written about. So. Yeah. Cool. No, I think it's, you. Can, I just like the idea that you're on the same page of just collect what's necessary. Like more is not necessarily better, that sort of mentality. Oh, oh, but, 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 like, uh, okay, so this is where there's a stark difference and you'll know it as well. Do you remember like uh, BC um, when we were actually allowed to go into bars and meet people? Um, when we would meet people and you try and explain what you do, not that I ever try and explain what I do, but let's say they ask, I would normally come up with an avoidant answer, like, oh, my company translates um, English language fitness information into Japanese. We help educate the market in Japan to fill the, the information gap that there is because of the language barrier. That shuts people up very quickly because they don't know where to go. But if I say that I do something with nutrition, if I say like, a, you know, I'm an <laughs> online nutrition coach, I, there are many different answers I could give here of, of what I do. Now, my day-to-day, -day, I identify as an online nutrition coach, really, nutrition and training coach. Um, then wow the wacky shit that people come out with like <laughs> that's when you hear it man right but that's not my clients but that's the people that I'm speaking to in the bar and then when you say ah yeah the, oh, what do you think of this and I'm like well shall I be polite here or <laughs> uh, um, I guess people have been sold a lot of stuff and then they can be almost incredulous that I, as a professional, am not using this newfangled method that they know about and they thought everyone was using because in their bubble, yeah, everyone's like, so they might see it as, oh, Andy's a bit behind the times here. Tape measure and body weight. <laughs> oh, please. Like, I've got my um, gut check uh, uh, DNA test with... Uh, my pear-shaped body type requires this level of intermittent fast and, you know, you know right? And it's like, okay, fella, rock yeah. on. <laughs> I think I, I literally just recently got an advert. I forget what it's called, but it was like something you breathe into, which tells you like what you're burning currently and then tells you what you should eat and when you should eat. And it's just like, <laughs> it's meant to simplify the process, but that doesn't sound like that's, that sounds 
kind of crazy to and, and it's impossible really <laughs> to work effectively right but the old school ways are i mean they're tried and true for a good reason and actually i'm glad you brought up the measurements again the body measurements because i think that is something i use not as heavily as you do but i have found definitely value in it to use it now and then um but i think there aren't as many people talking about the value in it so I don't know if you have, I don't have any specific questions around it. I don't know if you can talk to the value that you find in it. Uh, that'd be really cool to hear. Yeah, sure. So one heuristic that people can pick up, um, I see for every two to two and a half centimeters, so that's around an inch, um, off of the stomach, that is around four to five pounds of fat loss. So that's around two kilos of fat loss. I've seen that time and time and time again. That's awesome. Um, of course, the bigger someone is, like the trunk of a tree, you know, there's more fat in that ring. But like roughly, that's kind of where we're at there. And I would say when you're trying to gauge it, um, think of it as in two stomach measurement points or less. So if my nose is my navel, I'm doing, I tell people two inches above, two inches below, measure at the navel, two inches above, two inches below. Two inches isn't convenient, so just use three fingers. So they're measuring there, and then they're measuring there, all right? Um, and just above and below. And if they have two measurement sites with that change over a period of usually four-ish weeks, it would be around that amount of fat loss, right? And they're on track. Um, also, bear in mind that sometimes the measurements lag behind. And sometimes the measurements get ahead of the scale weight. These things fluctuate. Also, bear in mind that you'll usually see an initial dip from the first week that you measure your body to the next week. Why is that? I used to think it was that um, there was something to do with gut content loss there. But no, it's just people are not incentivized at that first measurement point to have the tape as tight as they otherwise would, right? That's great. <laughs> so I always see a dip there, right? This is the um, wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm just like, nah, nah, don't worry about that. Um, what else? Oh, so many things. Um, you're, bear in mind that you're, 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 uh, you've got fat on your chest and back. You've got fat all over your body. It's not just on your stomach. So you will see losses there. It doesn't mean that you've got muscle loss if your chest and back measurements get smaller. I don't have a heuristic for that, um, yeah. but I've seen a lot of the data. I know that roughly what looks right. Um, the opposite is going to happen when you bulk. So you can use that heuristic when you're bulking also to try to gauge how much fat you've gained versus muscle as well. Yeah. So that can be that can be quite useful once you've you know had that initial glycogen water and yeah. gut content kind of bump out of the way. Um, biceps, I do get people to measure their arms. I don't think it's very useful except for comparing six, twelve month intervals once they're at the same level of leanness. Unfortunately, that's because you can't put two inches on your arms in ten weeks. <laughs> Um, it's just, it's really super slow. So you yeah. may see fluctuations in there, but I would just say, please don't read too much into it. If your leg size goes down, bear in mind, you have fat on your legs as well when you're dieting. So that would be very normal as well. You'll feel it if you're wearing skinny jeans as well, you'll feel the difference. Yeah. Um, especially women as well, cause they're still more potentially, um, uh, generally in, uh, the thighs. Yeah. Yeah. I found particularly the measurements. Um, I think I remember you talking about it actually, because you take them at, is it every two weeks or every week you generally recommend? Once a week. So Once scale weight every day and yeah. then the measurements uh, every week. Yeah. Yeah. I think because you do them on a weekly basis, the people get uh, better at measuring. Uh, whereas yeah. I, I often take them, I ended up taking them monthly uh, for a lot of them. And the human error was just ridiculous like they just ended up becoming not helpful so that might be something I, I try and change obviously I mean it's it could be helpful data and I particularly have found it to be helpful and this is where I do end up getting them weekly particularly for clients who 
their scale weight is just not always the best indicator whether or not whenever they diet the scale weight is just like starts to just become not very helpful particularly with females a lot of the time so the waist measurement then it becomes particularly oh, yeah. helpful to oh, kind yeah. of see that yeah. change yeah 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 for sure man yeah um yeah i should mention here that i work with with men and um, because dieting is not just the what to do it's how to get people to do it so the psychological aspect is like a lot of this yeah. and you know i'm i've chosen that that's my niche that's not who i know how to speak to so that's who i focus on um but yeah if if you are a female or if you are have less training experience you're more likely to get a recomp effect scale weight is going to be slightly less useful in that case um if your stomach measurements are going down but your body weight is staying roughly the same rate you know happy days and you can still use that heuristic that i said before like two two and a half centimeters so around an inch of change about four four to five pounds of fat loss so it's around you know what 1.8 to 2.2 kilos of difference so hi guys steve here just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service at revive stronger we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. And then something else you also use, which I think a lot of the listeners will be familiar with, like the idea of using, I thought this is a great discussion because again, this is where uh, the kind of discussion around the topic versus the practice is difficult. So just as a baseline, like we often talk about body fat percentages as like potentially cutoff points for various times for massing and then cutting, which, like makes a lot of sense i think in many ways and you describe that in the book but then you go on to describe to be like so i tell you to use these but also i'm going to tell you from an evidence-based perspective there's really poor measurements like if you use like your uh, scale that tells you how much body fat you have like i know my like it, it doesn't matter what it. it is so mm. uh yeah in the book you have visuals which i don't think i think you have them on your website for free as well is that right yeah i do yeah, yeah. um I forget what that is. If you go to the menu and click on free guides, then you'll see body fat percentage in there. Click there. And what I've put together is um, body fat percentages from 7% through to 30 plus percent body fat. Yeah. Uh, they're all men um, because they're all client pictures over the years. If you look closely, you'll see that they are actually paired. Um, so you see like the before and afters in there, but across the pictures. So that's, uh, that was quite a nice, uh, thing I was able to add in there. Um, and then obviously like the different level of, by including many different physiques in there, many different people that of different builds, um, you get to get a gauge of how fat, um, how much fat people carry. Yeah. So if you want to say, figure out, are you 15% body fat right now? and more like 12, 11. We could go and have a look at that and then that will help tell you. What I would say though is don't look at yourself in the mirror, take a photo of yourself and then compare that photo because your eyes can trick you. The mirror can lie, right? This the, mirror, is, the mirror does lie. I wanted to touch on this actually because I remember reading it from you ages ago and I was like, this is awesome. I've again, never heard anyone talk about this was the perceptual adap adaptation. Mm. I loved it. Like just describe to the listeners what that is because I think everyone once they've heard it will be like, oh yeah, wow. Like that is true. <laughs> I don't know where I got it from, actually. Okay. Um, so I can't give credit, and I don't know that much about it. But effectively, like, your mind just gets used to you. Yeah. And um, you can stop seeing the changes over time. Think of it as you see you every day, but if you go and see a cousin that you haven't seen in a month, they might see the change, whereas you don't. Um, that's kind of really where this is at. Um, what you see in a mirror can be a lie because of, because of that, because there is, hmm, why would a photo be different there? I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's angles. I'm not quite sure what the science is behind that, but I think it's harder to bullshit yourself. When you're on your laptop screen and or, or your phone whatever like and you're just comparing the two side by side it's very hard to bullshit yourself yeah. there mm. yeah i think i don't i i guess 
I personally get it all the time where I like look in the mirror and like, it'll be a long time. I, just, I swear I haven't changed over the past year, but then you put, and even clients will say this and then you pull up like a photo from a year ago and you pull up a now and you look at it and you're like, okay, <laughs> something big's changed here. There's actually something has happened. And I think there might be something to it. Um, Cause Cliff Wilson, I've spoken to him about uh, the value in photos and he'll actually say he prefers photos to video. He prefers photos to even seeing like, athletes in person he actually would prefer them to like send a photo to him versus them come to his house so he could see how they look because he's there's something about a photo that just is maybe a little bit more objective that he can use uh i don't know I if want the same actually... light i want same like diet conditions same time of day like uh yeah. the works if possible um i had a client just yesterday i asked him to send two pictures of slightly lowered position for his boxer briefs um because he could have been covering some lower body uh, lower back fat there so he had them a little more toward his navel and he, so he took some pictures in his garden just maximum lighting there and i was like oh okay right. <laughs> yeah you, you're good <laughs> um <laughs> yeah uh, so i'll be uh, talking with him about a transition uh, back to maintenance and then into a bulk uh, and next check-in uh, in a week and a half so i'm looking forward to that conversation anyway um no photos can be very useful but preferably same condition same lighting same time of day so that you know same day of the week yeah and then you can compare and yeah. even and i've sorry no i was, uh, i, I want to say why i think body fat percentage is can be important but then what factors there are for like there are heuristics for when to end a cut and end a bulk and transition. But when to when to ignore those numbers and just go by feeling. I would like to kind of get into that, but you, you what were you going to say then? Steve? No, I think that would be really interesting because I think I, I'm in complete agreement because you could say 10% body fat visually get there, but for some people that might just be unrealistic for them to get down there. Um, like depends where they land. So yeah, for sure touch on that that'd be really cool so i say for a lot of clients um once they have been training for a while they want to try and keep most clients feel happy in that 10 to 15 percent body fat range and i think just to start, you said females can add like eight percent a lot of the time yes. on top yeah yes yes um and because they carry more essential fat. So if you are using a body fat um, measurement device, then that will help. Um, that will give you those numbers there. So, yeah, so women, please add 8% here. So if you're in the, that 10 to 15, so that's like 18 to 23% body fat range. Staying within that range, you're not going to feel too fat when you're bulking, generally speaking, as long as you have enough muscle mass to still kind of have muscle pressing against that skin and that fat under your skin so that you still look good. So that's why I say not, not new trainees. Um, and then at 10%, you're not at the point, most people are not at the point where they're like feeling super, super starved and just every, like the world sucks. Everything sucks. Just kill me now. Um, and that point happens certainly for all physique competitors, unless they're on massive amounts of drugs. And then even so, probably they're still hating life, right? The natural trainees, for sure, if they're on a stage, they are suffering, even though they're smiling. Those grimaces you see, their <laughs> smiles are grimaces, actually. So I cannot wait for my post-show pizza, right? So that is just unrealistic. But you might be able to get down to 8%. And, and be happy and maintain that. Most people are gonna be somewhere like 10, 10 to 12. So diet, I'd suggest people diet down to around 10 to 12 and then bulk for a maximum of say 20. But really you probably, if you've dieted down to 10, bulk up to about 15. If you did your bulk right, that'll be you know a decent amount of fat a decent amount of muscle in there along with that fat. And then you can proceed to um, increase your muscle mass over time in steps. It's like you're running up a mountain and then you're walking across a plateau and that plateau bumps immediately into the next mountain. And just over time, you are 
increasing your muscle mass. What's changing is your weight is going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, but training up over time because of the fat mass changes there. So while I say that those 10 and 15% figures, if you want to go over 15% because you're, you're really enjoying your bulking phase, you can continue, absolutely. And if you just don't care about that additional body fat, that's fine. Um, if you get down to, say, 13% body fat or something like that, and you're like, oh, life really sucks right now. I don't want to continue here. Okay, come to maintenance. Sit around there for a little bit. See how you feel. If you, you, know, you, you really still feel the same and you can't go back, you don't want to go back into it, then bulk. But what I'd say to you there is just be careful of a couple of things. Um, first, you have to ask yourself honestly, would I be okay in gaining back 3 to 5% body fat at this point? Am I going to be all right with that? Because that's where you will be. Will I be comfortable in my own skin? Five months down the line, six months down the line. If the answer to that is no, you need to embrace the suck and get a little bit leaner, even if that means being a little skinnier than you would ideally like before you bulk. Because otherwise you're going to stop your bulk. Yeah. You're not going to feel happy, right? The other thing is just bear in mind that everybody, everybody feels their puniest at that point just before their abs come through. That's the hardest point for everyone because they've done all the work in dieting, but they've got almost none of the visual. I'm not talking about someone who was fat before, but like they've done that work in in dieting, taking that bit of fat off, but they're not receiving that visual reward yet of having that the abs come through. Sure, maybe your forearms are looking a bit veinier and maybe, you know, but like, so when you get to that point, understand that that is like that for everyone. Try to push through and then you'll get that reward yeah i think jeff alberts calls that like the tweener stage or something where it's like you've been dying a while but it doesn't really look like it yet you're just like smaller <laughs> right I, I love it the tweener stage okay but i i really appreciate the discussion behind where people might be at that like they're lean but they're not that lean yet and they're like oh i don't want to diet anymore and it's as simple as you just laid out like why don't you just put the brakes on, maintain here for a while, like you can build your calories hopefully a little bit higher uh, over that time as well, feel better, and then go again unless you think, and like you said, like you don't want to say, oh, yeah, you could just mass, but if it's one month, I mean, you're better off just maintaining and going down again because one month, what are you going to build as a natural training in a month? I mean, very, very little, so <laughs> it's, it's just not worth it. Uh, so I, I love that description, and I mean, that's the sort of, kind of uh, descriptions you have in the book where it's very much like it might look like we need to make this decision but check off all of this first to make sure that is the right decision to make and if all that's in yeah. place then it, that is the right decision to make uh so i think if the People. the listeners have sorry no go on sorry. i was gonna say if the listeners have enjoyed like some of these discuss discussions that we're talking around i mean they get so much value from the book because you you just lay it all out thank you man yeah, the last thing I'd say ties into here is like people can, they ask, well, what's the maximum level of leanness I can maintain? Well, this really depends on you, like your, your physiology. So how your hunger and fullness signals are compared with other people. Like why are some people obese, right? Is it because they're just lazy? Well, no, we know that good part of it is that they just feel hungry, a lot hungrier than you do for the same level of food. That's off. Some people are naturally skinnier than others. Why is that? It's because they don't feel as hungry. Some parts of it is, right? Yeah. So your hunger and fullness signals are going to play into that. And that's going to differ depending on different body fat points. So you may feel fine and not hungry at the time all the time at say 11 percent, but nine percent is just a step too far for you then also your feelings of fatigue are going to be in here they're going to come into play um, you may feel much different at a slightly higher or you may be fine so don't always look at other people and and compare and also bear in mind that how someone looks on their instagram that may be just a momentary thing the other thing you need to think of is 
what am I prepared to sacrifice to maintain this leanness? Like if you have to, the only way you can maintain it, because you're not very good at like eyeballing your foods when you go out to eat, then you have to sacrifice the number of times you go out to eat. Do you want to do that? Does that matter that much to you? Right? So the, a lot of it is yeah. personal choice as well. We have to keep up like a 20,000 step count or something <laughs> horrendous. <laughs> I just, right, right, so right, many, right, right. You're right. There is, there's definitely trade-offs um, completely. Uh, Andy, I, I want to say a massive thank you for this chat. Uh, hopefully it's given people a taster of, I mean, what they can get from you, uh, from your website, but also from the book. If people want to pick it up, uh, where should they head? And if they want to learn more about you and keep up to date with what you're up to, where should they look? Uh, yeah, just go to ripbody.com and uh, they'll see the free nutrition setup guide on there if they're interested in that. I don't expect people to, yeah, maybe the they've listened to this podcast and they think, yeah, the books for me, I already know about nutrition setup. Cool. If that's the case, then just click on uh, the books uh, tab in the menu and then you can get it from there. There's much more of a description on there. And as I said, like if you don't think it was worth it, then just ask for a refund. So, you know, you've got nothing to, no concerns here. I'm not going to rip you off. Um, you can rip me off though. <laughs> Like, I'm sure people have asked me for a refund over the years, but you know the wonderful thing? People don't take the piss. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very low percentage rate there, so that's nice. And also when, like, last year when coronavirus hit, and I just emailed out to people and said, look, would you like a free copy? Like, here, here all my stuff is on sale, and it's a shit time. My books are on sale. We've got the Muscle and Strength Premium books on sale, and we've got the Last Shred on sale, as it was called then. Um here you go it's like i think we did 40 percent off or something right and then we also said if you're struggling right now but you need a distraction you can't afford this you'd really really like it just send me an email and let me know you don't have to explain your situation just pay it forward and i will give it you for free and i think we gave away 60 books cool. in total i know when you consider that as an email like I forget if I'm combining like Eric and uh, the 3 DMJ email. I said, I said just mine. Like when you consider that was sent out to like 20, 25,000 people, that's, isn't that a wonderful thing? Yeah. There's so few people are, they're, they're, they're not thinking in terms of like taking advantage. They just really appreciate the gesture. So yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Oh, and if you want to grab me on, uh, on Instagram, um, Andy underscore uh, ripped body. That is a brand. It's not a description. I, it's not a particularly vain. Um, I didn't read Instagram it like that today. <laughs> when I tagged you, I was like, I think this is, he's catfishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I hate that. It's like when you go out, people ask for your Instagram. It's like, oh God. <laughs> don't like, cause they just think I'm vain, right? It's like, yeah. no, no, it's not. <laughs> like ripped andy no no that's, that's the brand that's amazing. Um, but yeah, that, that's the thing i've made the business as have you all about what we do for our clients it's not about us and how we look sure we're on a journey as well and i know you certainly share your journey um and you do a really really good job of that but um yeah i think that's that's important you make it about what we can do for people or what our content can do for people because that gives them hope right That's what you're, this is about. you're better at that than me <laughs> my my instagram at least is quite heavily about me i'm trying to change it a little bit actually uh, as a business decision but uh <laughs> i think i think you get a good a nice mix in there of like um your own personal shots your training seeing you training really hard those sissy squats you put out today or yesterday man that was not They're looking nice <laughs> oh horrendously good yeah <laughs> Uh, no, I think Amazing. you get a good balance, man. Keep it up. I appreciate Thank that. You. Um, and guys, like, definitely check out Andy. Check out his stuff. Um, and if you do end up picking it up, like, um, yeah, um, give uh, give Andy a, a heads up and let him know. Yeah, let's really appreciate think. it. And uh, we'll yeah. talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course.
The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.